because I realized I didn't really give a good introduction to who Franz Fanon was. Um, the footage you're about to see, I shot it earlier and uh, read an excerpt from his book, The Wretched of the Earth, but I at least wanted to introduce him, uh, especially to anyone in the audience who is new or hasn't heard of Franz Fanon. Uh, so Franz Fanon was an individual who was born in the island of Martinique in the early 20th century. He was a trained psychiatrist and also a political philosopher. Uh, he was a political radical and also a pan-Africanist and a Marxist humanist concerned with the psychopathology of colonization. And The Wretched of the Earth is a book that he wrote uh, which focuses on the psychological and psychiatric analysis of the dehumanizing effects of colonialism. So that's just a little bit about Frantz Fanon and his book The Wretched of the Earth which was originally written in French. He was a French speaker. He spent a lot of time in Algeria uh, helping with the revolutionary movement there. Uh, and so that's a, that's a bit of background about Franz Fanon. What's up YouTube? How y'all doing? Um, excuse the video quality. I wanted to create this with my uh, better camera, but unfortunately, uh, you know, technical issues at the moment. Uh, so I have to do the best I could do. But I wanted to create this video um, regarding uh, the, the recent death of Takeoff from the Migos. I know a lot of YouTube content creators have been talking about it. Um, it was in the news a few weeks ago. But I just wanted to share at least uh, some points from the book of The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. I was reading it recently and I thought his words were very poignant. And this is uh, from the section of the book uh, uh, titled, or subsection of the book titled, From the North African, uh, the North African's Criminal Impulsiveness to the War of National Liberation. So I wanted to read a little bit of this and leave you with some of his words uh, just to reflect on and think about, especially in the context of not only the death of Takeoff, but the uh, the current state of the African American people uh, in the United States. Uh, so let me just read a little bit of his words. And again, this is from the North Africans' criminal impulsiveness to the war of national liberation. Over recent years, I've had the opportunity to verify the fundamental fact that honor, dignity, and integrity are only truly evident in the context of national and international unity. As soon as you and your fellow men are cut down like dogs, there is no other solution but to use every means available to reestablish your weight as a human being. You must therefore weigh as heavily as possible on your torturer's body so that his wits, which have wandered off somewhere, can at last be restored to their human dimension. During the course of recent years, I have had the opportunity to witness the extraordinary examples of honor, self-sacrifice, love of life, and disregard of death and in Algeria at war. And I'll continue on and sort of I'm skimming over this. But one of the characteristics of the Algerian people established by colonialism is their appalling criminality. Prior to 1954, magistrates, police, lawyers, journalists, and medical examiners were unanimous that the Algerians' criminality posed a problem. The Algerian, it was claimed, was a born criminal. A theory was elaborated and scientific proof was furnished. This theory was taught at universities for more than 20 years. Algerian medical students received this education and slowly and imperceptibly, the elite, after having consented to colonialism, consented to the natural defects of the Algerian people, born idlers born liars, born thieves, and born criminals. We propose here to expound this official theory, this official theory to recall its basis and scientific reasoning. In the second stage, we shall review the facts and endeavor to reinterpret them. So he goes on and lists examples that, you know, these theories that the French created about the Algerian. The first is the Algerian as an habitual killer. In fact, the magistrates will tell you that four-fifths of the cases heard involve assault and battery. The crime rate in Algeria is one of the highest in the world, they claim. 
they are, they are no petty delinquents. When the Algerian, and this applies to all North, Af or North Africans, puts himself on the wrong side of the law, he always goes to the extremes. The Algerian is a savage killer, and his weapon of choice is the knife. The magistrates, who know the country, in quotations, have elaborated their own theory on the subject. The Kabyles, for example, prefer a revolver or shotgun. The Arabs from the plains have a preference for the knife. Some magistrates wonder whether Algerian, whether the Algerian does not have a need to see the to see blood. The Algerian will tell you, needs to feel the heat of blood and steep himself in his victim's blood. These magistrates and police officers very seriously hold forth on the connections between the Muslim psyche and blood. A number of magistrates even go so far as to say that killing a man for an Algerian means first and foremost slitting his throat. The savagery of the Algerian manifests itself in particular by the number of wounds, many of them inflicted unnecessarily after their victim's death. Autopsies undeniably establish this fact. The killer gives the impression he wanted to kill an incalculable number of times given the equal deadliness of the wounds afflicted. The Algerian is a senseless killer. Very often the magistrates and police officers are stunned by the motives for the murder. A gesture, an illusion, an ambiguous remark, a quarrel over the ownership of an olive tree, or an animal that has strayed a few feet. The search for the cause, which is expected to justify and pin down the murder, in some cases a double or triple murder, turns up a hopelessly trivial murder, uh, motive. Hence the frequent impression that the community is hiding the real motives. Finally, robbery by an Algerian is always breaking and entering in some cases involving murder, and in every case involving assault of the owner. All these elements focalizing on Algerian criminality appear sufficiently evident to support an attempt at systemization, since similar though less implicit observations had been conducted in Tunisia and Morocco, reference was increasingly made to a North African criminality. For more than 30 years under the con constant direction of Professor Perrault, professor of psychiatry at the faculty of Algiers, several teams worked on defining this criminality and on this criminality's modes of expression and offering sociological, functional, and anatomical interpretation. The main research work on the question conducted by the psychiatric school of the faculty of Algiers will be the basis of our conclusions. Research finding conducted over more than 20, over a 20 year period were the subject we recall of lectures given by the chair of psychiatry. Consequently, the Algerian doctors who graduated from the faculty of Algiers were forced to hear and learn that the Algerian is a born criminal. Moreover, I remember one, one of us in all seriousness expounding these theories he had learned and adding, it's hard to swallow, but it's been scientifically proved. So how does the Algerian school account for this anomaly? Firstly, according to the School of Algiers, killing oneself is tantamount to examining one's own fem fem uh, feelings. Looking at oneself and practicing introspection, the Algerian, however, rebels against his inner feelings. There's no inner life in the North African. On the contrary, on the, contrary the North African rids himself of his troubles by attacking the people around him. He has no sense of analysis. Since by definition, melancholia is a disorder, of the moral conscience, it is obvious the Algerian can only develop pseudo melancholias given the unreliability of his conscience and the fickleness of his moral sense. The incapacity of the Algerian to analyze a situation, to organize a mental panorama, makes perfect sense if we refer to two types of causality by the French psychiatrist. First of all, his mental capacity. The Algerian is mentally retarded. This is according to the French psychiatrist. If we want to fully understand the basic point of departure, we must recall the seminology, the semiology elaborated by the school of Algiers. The native, it says, presents the following characteristics. Complete or almost complete lack of emotivity, highly prejudiced and suggestible, 
doggedly stubborn, childlike mentality minus the curiosity of the European child, prone to accidents and pithiatic reactions. The Algerian is unable to grasp an overall picture. The questions he asks himself are always concerns with details and rule out synthesis. Pointillistic, attracted to objects, lost in details, insensitive to ideas, and closed to concepts. Verbal expression is reduced to a minimum. His movements are always impulsive and aggressive, incapable of interpreting details on the basis of the overall picture. The Algerian absolutizes the component and takes one part of the whole. As a, con as a consequence, his reactions are generalizing when confronted with minor provocations or trivialities such as a fig tree, a jester, or a sheep on his land. The congenital aggressiveness looks for outlets and is content with the slightest pretext. It is aggressiveness in a pure state. So he continues with the theories of Perrault and these French psychiatrists. Uh, so, uh, I will then continue on to the alternative reason, the reinterpretation uh, which uh, Franz Fanon gives. So, we now had to find an explanation. Could it be said that the war, the privileged terrain for expressing finally a collective aggressiveness directs congenital, congenitally murderous acts at the occupier. It is common knowledge that significant social upheavals lessen the occurrence of misdemeanors and mental disorders. The existence of war, which was breaking Algeria into two and rejecting the judicial and administrative machine onto the side of the enemy was therefore a perfectly good explanation for this decline in Algerian criminality. In the countries of the Maghreb, already liberated, however, this was true during the liberation struggles and remains so to an even greater degree during independence. It is therefore apparent that the colonial context is sufficiently uh, original to afford a reinterpretation of criminality. This is what we have done for the militants. Today, everyone on our side knows that criminality is not the result of the Algerian's congenital nature nor the configuration of his nervous system. The war in Algeria and the wars of national liberation bring about the true protagonist. We have demonstrated that in the colonial situation, the colonized are confronted with themselves. They tend to use each other as a screen. Each prevents his neighbor from seeing the national enemy. And when exhausted after a 16 hour day of hard work, the colonized subject collapse, collapses on his mat and a child on the other side of the canvas partition cries and prevents him from sleeping. It just so happens it's a little Algerian. When he goes to bed for a little semolina and a little oil from the shopkeeper who already owes who he already owes several hundred francs and his request is turned down, he is overwhelmed by an immense hatred and desire to kill, and the shopkeeper happens to be an Algerian. When after weeks of keeping a low prof profile, he finds himself cornered one day by the cave demanding his taxes. He is not even allowed the opportunity to direct, to direct his hatred against the European administrator. Before him stands the cave who excites his hatred, and he happens to be an Algerian. Exposed to daily incitement to murder resulting from famine, eviction from his home from unpaid rent, a mother's withered breast, children who are nothing but skin and bone, the closure of a work site, and the jobless who hang around the foremen like crows. The colonized subject comes to see his fellow man as a relentless enemy. If he stubs his bare feet on a large stone on the path, it is a fellow countryman who has put it there. And the meager olives he was about to pick, here are ex's children who have eaten them during the night. Yes, during the colonial period in Algeria and elsewhere, a lot of things can be committed for a few pounds of semolina. One can kill. You need to use your imagination to understand these things. Or our memory. In the concentration camps, men killed each other for a morsel of bread. 
I can recall one horrible scene. It was in Oran in, 1950, in 1944 from the military camp where we were waiting to embark. The soldiers threw bits of bread to some Algerian children who fought for them in a frenzy of rage and hatred. A veterinarian can no doubt explain the events in terms of the famous pecking order, noted in farmyards where the corn is bitterly fought over. The strongest birds gobble up all the grain, while the less aggressive grow visibly thinner. Any colony tends to become one vast farmyard, one vast concentration camp, where only law is that of the knife. In Algeria, everything has changed since the War of National Liberation. The entire reserves of a family, or mecha, can be offered to a passing company of soldiers in a single evening. A family can lend its only donkey to carry a wounded fighter. And when several days later, the owner learns that the animal was gunned down by a plane, he will not sling curses or threats. Instead of questioning the death of his donkey, he will anxiously ask, whether the men, whether the wounded man is safe and sound. Under a colonial regime, no crime is too petty for a loaf of bread or a wretched sheep. Under a colonial regime, man's relationship with the physical world and the history is connected to food. In a context of oppression like that of Algeria, that of Algeria for the colonized, living does not mean embodying a set of values does not mean integrating oneself into the coherent, constructive development of a world. To live simply means not to die. To exist means staying alive. Every date grown is a victory. Not the result of hard work, but a victory celebrating a triumph over life. Stealing dates, therefore, or allowing one sheep to eat the neighbor's grass, is not a disregard of property rights or breaking law or disrespect. They are attempts at murder. Once you have seen men and women in Kabila struggling down into the valley for weeks on end to bring up soil in little, in little baskets, you can understand that theft is attempted murder and not a peccadillo. What do you take it out on? What do you take out this frustration on? The French are down in the plain with the police, the army and their tanks. In the mountains, there are only Algerians. Up above, heaven with his promises of af afterlife. Down below, the French with their firm promises of jail, beatings and executions. Inevitably, you stumble up against yourself. Here lies this core of self-hatred that characterizes racial conflict in segregated societies. The criminality of the Algerian, his impulsiveness, the savagery of his murder are not, therefore, the consequence of how his nervous system is organized or specific character traits, but the direct result of the colonial situation. The fact that the Algerian patriots discussed this issue, that they were not afraid to challenge the beliefs inculcated in them by colonialism, that they understood each was a screen for the other, and in reality they were committing suicide by pitting themselves against their neighbor, was to have immense impact on the revolutionary consciousness. Once again, the colonized subject fights in order to put an end to domination, but he must also ensure that all the untruths planted within him by the oppressor are eliminated. In a colonial regime, such as the one in Algeria, the ideas taught by colonialism impacted not only the European minority, but also the Algerian. Total liberation involves every, as every facet of the personality, the ambush or the skirmish, the torture or the massacre of one's comrades entrenched the determination to win, revives the unconscious and, unnurtured and nurtures the imagination. When the nation in its totality is set in motion, the new man is not a posteriori creation of this nation, but coexists with it, matures with it, and triumphs with it. The dialectical prerequisite explains 
their resistance to accommodating forms of colonization or window dressing. Independence is not a magical ritual, but is an indispensable condition for men and women to exist in true liberation. In other words, to master all the material resources necessary for a radical transformation of society. And that was Franz Fanon uh, discussing the uh, criminality of the Algerian, offering the French perspective that was established in Algeria and taught in the universities, and uh, offering the reinterpretation uh, that emerged during the Algerian Revolution. Uh, I definitely recommend that you all uh, read this book, find this book. Again, it is The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, and I think uh, many of the words which describe the Algerians um, can also be applicable to African Americans or other groups around the world. Thank you. Till next time.